All right, thank you. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a new method that could be used to plan full up system level live fire test. Um, this method is going to be a lot more um, stru or structured than our current approach. Um, and ultimately, it will produce the two figures that you see on the screen, a chart um, that kind of shows uh, with each sequential or with each additional test how much more information you learn and then a corresponding table. So this is a little bit of a teaser for where we're, where we're going here uh, through the slides. Uh, so the first thing that I wanted to do uh, was explain what live fire testing is for those that don't know. Uh, today we're going to talk, I'm going to talk mostly, well, actually exclusively about ground vehicle live fire testing. Um, and that's what's shown in this picture. So this is an underbody blast test. So imagine like a mine um, detonated underneath a vehicle. Um, you can see that that's pretty uh, extreme. Um, and this is what we actually test uh, on vehicles prior to fielding. We do this pretty routinely. Uh, and the objective is to understand how well the vehicles can perform in an operational environment. Um, and so there's a couple things that you need to consider. Um, when planning these testing. One is the operational environment that it's going to be in, what types of missions are, is it going to conduct, and then you also need to factor in the uh, specific features of the vehicle. Um, in some cases, just changing the threat location by a couple of inches can have a drastically different result. Um, and so you have to consider all of those things uh, when planning tests. So I'm also going to be talking about full-up system-level live fire testing, which is, again, what's shown here. For full system, system level, that requires a production representative test asset that's fully configured for combat. Um, and so the overall question that we want to ask is how many of those tests do we need to do? I already described how complex the, the environment can be in terms of operationally and then also the vehicle, but we're constrained uh, by resources because if it's very expensive to conduct these tests. We can only blow up so many vehicles. Um, and so how do you balance these two things? Um, and that's ultimately the question that we're after uh, today. So I'm going to present an approach for how we do that. How do we, how do we determine how many fusel events are necessary for a program? Uh, we're going to do that using a quantitative optimization algorithm. Um, and this is analogous to the type of DOE that's used to plan operational test and evaluation. Um, although it is different, <laughs> if we don't use a, a traditional power analysis, I'll say that right off the start. Um, I'm going to walk through a notional example just to illustrate proof of concept of how this can work. And then lastly, I'll just touch on uh, the future work that is needed before we can really employ this in practice. So I want to start by just saying that design of experiments can be both a general approach to planning tests and also a particular set of tools. So the general approach, um, we kind of have it outlined here in four major steps, identifying the test objectives. Uh, and metrics, defining the factor space, positing relationship between those factors, uh, and then choosing a set of test points that fulfills some type of criteria, and there are several listed here. Uh, in our particular application, we're going to use that same general approach, uh, but we aren't going to use the typical tools that you would think of with DOE, like a power analysis. Um, I described how complex the the environment is, and if we were to use a power analysis, it would result in far more tests than we could actually conduct. Um, and so we're still going to use the same general thought process and structure of design of experiments, but not the traditional tools. So we're going to identify the test objectives, define the space of potential shots, posit relationships between factors and outcomes, and then choose test points. In this case, we're optimizing for the information gained. So that's the overall approach, um, and it is, we're just um, stating that it's analogous to traditional DOE. So here's an overview of our approach. Um, I'm going to go into all of this in far more detail, but I just kind of wanted to give a pretty high-level overview to start um, for how this would work. So in the top left, you'll see um, a table uh, with factors and levels. We would do this, um, again, just like traditional DOE, identify the factors and the levels that are important for your particular application. And using this, we would identify all of the potential fusel shots that you can conduct. This is far more than we know we actually could conduct, but we want to start by just scoping the problem of what is even possible. The next step is to assign priority to all of those potential shots. Um, and that's what that color chart in the bottom left. Um, we do that using subject matter expertise, and I'll walk through that in more detail in the coming slides. Um, we use that input to feed an algorithm. That algorithm will optimize um, all of the information that you provide and ultimately generate these two um, figures on the right, the chart and the table, 
Um, and again, I'll go through all of that in more detail, but that's the general approach that we're going to use here. So I've talked a little bit about live fire testing, and I've briefly explained what FUSIL is. It's this end test, um, production representative, combat loaded. It's essentially a capstone activity, or you can think of it as like the final exam of a system before it's actually fielded. Um, and so that's shown here on this table. There's lots of other live fire testing that we do prior to fielding a vehicle. Um, and that's shown here with what a building block diagram. So the blocks that are at the bottom are usually conducted earlier. We usually have more information there because there's less fidelity, cheaper to conduct, easier to conduct. Um, and as the program progresses, we get uh, more representative uh, systems that we can test, and therefore we can test less of them. Um, throughout all of the testing, all the data feeds modeling and simulation, and that is also used to support the evaluation. And so ultimately, the way FUSIL fits in is it kind of fills in the gaps that every, all the other testing has not already answered. Um, and so it should be viewed in context with all of the other testing that we're planning. Another important aspect of FUSIL um, is that it primarily addresses operational issues. So some of the earlier testing might focus on um, design issues such as can the armor protect against the specific threat? It's more of a specific design question. FUSIL is more geared towards answering questions like um, if this threat does perforate the vehicle or does damage the vehicle, what's the residual capability? What, what, uh, how is the mission affected by the loss of the system or that system? Um, so there's a slightly different uh, context and type of information that we're hoping to gain with FUSIL as well. So currently, I guess before we should talk about a new way to plan it, I should at least a little bit talk about how we currently plan it. Um, so FUSIL testing currently is planned by relying on subject matter expertise um, from several key groups. Um, dot and &E, which is the organization that I support, uh, program managers, service evaluators, user representatives, and the threat community. Um, and ultimately, this group of um, experts get together. They each have their own different expertise and um, perspective that they add to which tests are important. And they consider things like the operational context, the expected missions, what data is already out there, MS capabilities, scope of those earlier building block tests. Um, and all of those things come together, and the group of experts determine how many uh, tests they think they need and where they think, which conditions we should test under. Um, so there isn't a specified process. It's really, you know, when all of this group of experts kind of agree. Um, and ultimately, the most critical shots to test in FUSIL generally result in troop casualties, because of course we care when any warfighter is injured. That's something we would definitely want to know prior to fielding. Um, it would result in a loss of mission essential functions. Again, we kind of want to characterize what's the residual capability. If we lose, if there's some type of damage, what can the platform still do? And then also some uncertainty in the test outcome. So if we are pretty certain we know what's going to happen, we don't need to test there, right? We want to test situations where we are more uncertain about what's going to happen because we learn more from those conditions. Okay, so now that I've kind of given the background on what FUSIL is and how we currently plan it, I'll start walking through a notional example. Um, so again, the first step is to fully define the design space. So we're going to consider a notional vehicle today, um, actually a family of vehicles. So imagine there's a family of vehicles with five different variants. And there's some common elements across those vehicles. In this case, I'm going to say the, the engine and the, the front of the vehicle, like the engine and the driver, that's pretty much common across all the variants, but the rear of the vehicle is unique for each different uh, vehicle. Um, so some similarities and some differences. For simplicity, I'm only going to consider one threat, just underbody blast, just to make it a little bit more digestible in terms of what we're actually planning here. Um, and then for, you can see um, in the bottom, I kind of have all the factors and all the, lever, the levels listed out. Um, so again, five variants, just one threat category. There's three threat severities. So threshold level is generally like the, the level the vehicle is designed to protect against the requirements. Beyond threshold level is a little bit beyond that. Maybe we think the vehicle can provide some protection at that level. And then objective level is like what we would like to see the vehicle able to protect against, but we might not be able to get there. Um, and then I, there's five different locations that we've identified for this. Um, 
And if we were to conduct a full factorial design based on these factors and levels, that would result in 75 possible underbody blast events, which um, just for context, I don't think I've ever seen an entire fusel program with 75 uh, fusel events, much less just for one threat category. Um, normal for underbody blast is, you know, five-ish. Um, so, so the question is, given these 75 possible events, which five-ish are best to conduct? Oops. Um, and so for FUSIL, we know that most of the design space is not relevant. So one, we might have adequate information from other sources that can be earlier tests. That also could be other FUSIL tests that we conduct. So there's some similarities um, between those 75 uh, proposed FUSIL events. Some combinations result in obvious outcomes, either severe overmatch or undermatch. So again, that's kind of what I'm getting at. If, um, if we know that it's going to you know, completely destroy the vehicle, we don't learn a lot from testing that. Uh, we kind of already know that. So we really want to focus our resources for FUSIL on uh, conditions where we have uncertainty in the outcome, but we do expect that there's some substantial um, effect on the outcome of a mission, either from vehicle effects or uh, crew casualties. And so for every potential FUSIL shot, we need to understand three questions that we're going to propose that the subject matter experts need to answer. Um, the first is how severely do we expect the shot to affect vehicle and crew survivability? Um, so those are lumped together, both effects to the vehicle and to the crew members. The second is related to that. How certain are we of that estimate? So you can imagine for one case, we might say we think this is going to be a really severe event and we know that. Um, for another shot, we could say we might think we think this is a really severe event, but we aren't quite sure. And those are different inputs. And so we want to uh, characterize that using the certainty of the estimate. And then the last estimate, uh, separate from that, which is how similar is this proposed fusel event to all of the other ones? Um, as I mentioned, some of those 75 events might be pretty similar, and we don't want to test two of the similar ones because then we would learn a lot of the same information. We want to spread those points out so that we learn different information from the test that we propose. So those three inputs are the main... Um, categories that we're looking for are the main questions that we're asking the subject matter experts to rate, uh, to use, to prioritize which events we need to conduct. So again, most critical shots are those that have potentially high but uncertain mission effects. Uh, we lump the uh, vehicle and crew effects together when we score them. Um, when it comes to certainty, um, just some more context there. So. High, there's lots of ways that you can describe certainty. Certainty can be can come from um, past testing on similar systems. Um, a high certainty shot would have lots of past testing. Low certainty would have minimal relevant testing. Um, the threat could be well understood or not well understood. Um, again, talking about overmatches or undermatches of the system versus being kind of at that design threshold. The quality and validation of the MNS, how well MNS can help answer those questions, also plays a role. Um, and then some of those earlier building block tests can also help drive certainty. Um, one thing to be, I guess, another aspect to consider, though, is I mentioned before there's this operational context of fusel testing. And so sometimes that is earlier component testing. Um, will answer some questions, but they don't consider synergistic effects or they don't really put the results into a mission context. And so sometimes even though we have part of the answer from earlier tests, we will want to repeat those tests um, to get that mission context. Um, and that just depends um, on certain aspects and, and the particular program. Okay, so I talked about the three inputs that we need. We need the severity of the mission effects and the certainty of that estimate, and then we also need the similarity to all the, of the other fusel shots. So those first two that we need are related, um, and you can imagine um, that you would plot all of those on a color chart like this. So the magnitude of mission effects is shown, I guess it's not really a y-axis, but imagine the y-axis here, um, and then the certainty is the x. Um, and so we have five categories that we established, and SMEs would essentially take all of the for each potential fusel shot, you would put it into one of these boxes. Um, we've provided a notional color chart here. This could change based on each program. Um, but here in yellow is what we're saying are the most critical shots to test. Blue are important but less critical to, um, shots to test. And then purple are ones that we aren't really that interested in. 
And again, this really maps to what I've been saying all along. If we have a lot of certainty, um, if we're up here, very high certainty, we generally don't need to test those conditions because we kind of know the outcomes. We want to prioritize testing where we have very low certainty and then medium to high levels of uh, severity. Um, and so using this, we can help determine the criticality of each potential fusel shot based on the subject matter expertise input. So the next thing is to talk about factors and shot relationships. How is everything related? So in traditional DOE, um, there's usually some model that kind of describes this, but that doesn't lend itself well to the fusel environment. There's lots of nonlinearities. There's lots of differences. Um, and so the way that we've uh, worked around that is essentially we've defined what we're calling a similarity score, where zero is basically no similarity, so that would be where no factors are identical between two potential facial shots. Um, and one would basically be these shots are practically identical, um, and then everything else is somewhere between zero and one. So overall, the similarity score is basically a measure of um, if we've conducted fusel shot one, how much more will we learn about doing fusel shot number two? Um, it's essentially a measure of that. So here's an example. Again, using the same notional example of um, the vehicle, the family of vehicles that I described before. Um, so I'll, sh I'll start. We're only looking at underbody blast in this example, so those are the same already. Um, the variant is different. In shot number one, it's variant A. In shot number two, it's variant B. But the location is under the engine in both of these shots. And if you remember, in this notional vehicle, the engine's the same across the two variants. So we can essentially neglect the fact that the variant is different. So the main difference between these two uh, shots is the threat severity. So shot number one is at the threshold level, what the vehicle is designed to protect against. Shot number two is at the objective level, what we would like the vehicle to protect against. And so the question is, how much would we learn from doing shot two if we've already done shot one? And this is something that subject matter experts would have to, would have to score. It would be somewhere between zero and one. It would depend on the program. Um, but this is, you know, some quality, it's quantitative, um, but just based on opinion of how similar these two events are. And we would do this um, for shot number one. In this example, there's 75 potential fusel shots, so we would have 74 different numbers uh, because we would have to compare shot one and shot two, shot one and shot three, et cetera. Uh, so we do this many times to get the full similarity score matrix. So now, at this point, we've provided all of the inputs that we're going to provide. So now how do we, how do we put it all together? Um, and so this is where the algorithm comes in. Um, the first step is to look at the critical information from each shot. Um, and if you remember that color chart from a couple slides ago with the yellow, the blue, and the purple, um, that's where the criticalities come from. So the things in yellow were most critical, blue were less critical, and purple were least critical. The next step is to calculate the total information gained from conducting a shot, and that's based on how similar um, the shots are to all of the other potential shots. So if shot A is very similar to lots of other highly critical shots, we are going to learn a lot from conducting that one shot. If it's very different and kind of unique, we're not going to learn a lot about the overall system. We would just learn about that one particular event. Um, so using all of those inputs, the algorithm sorts all of those and prioritizes um, which events are most important to conduct based on the criticality and the similarity. Um, and it identifies you will learn the most information from doing shot number 12. Um, and then it will basically repeat. So assuming that you've done shot number 12, um, the criticality is reduced for shots that are similar to shot number 12. Um, because again, if we've already learned some of that information, then we don't need to test similar shots to that. Um, and then the overall cycle is repeated. And so at the end, basically the algorithm selects for shots that have high criticality and high similarity to other critical shots, but also shots that aren't related to previously selected shots. So we end up with a good balance of highly critical um, shots that tell us the most about the system and the least number of shots. And so ultimately that results in these two um, outputs here. Um, so first I want to talk about the graph on the right. 
So we have um, the number of shots shown here on the x-axis and then the amount of critical information on the y-axis. Um, and you can see that with each successive shot, we learn a little bit more about Fusil. Um, and so this is a tool that can be used to kind of help determine how many tests do we need to do. Um, you could just identify a knee in the curve. Um, there isn't really an obvious one here. Um, but we have identified three different groups, and we think that using this com information in combination with the table on the left is helpful. So if you look at the group in red, say you're really limited on the amount of resources that you have available for testing, you can only conduct four shots, um, then maybe you would look at these four. These are all beyond threshold events, which are more um, variable. Um, but they're generalizable across all variants, so all of the shot locations are things that we rated as similar across all five variants. If you have more test um, resources, you could add the threshold level shots in where we have a little bit more certainty, but again, these are all still generalizable shots across all of the variants. And given lots more test resources, um, you could actually conduct some of the um, locations in the crew compartment which was different. So these were locations which were important but unique shot lines. And so this technique doesn't really give you an answer, but it helps give you context for given your particular program, what are you looking for, how many, what are your resources, um, what makes sense, what's the optimal number of tests for your particular situation. Um, so one question we've gotten a lot is, what is the amount of critical information gained? Like, how do I think about that? Because this is kind of a new metric that we, we kind of made up, right? So what does that mean? Um, and so I just want to make the point that it's, it's, it's analogous to a power curve. It's not power. Um, but you can think of it similarly. So sa with increasing sample size, generally power increases, right? And the same is true with the amount of critical information gained. Um, also, like power, in some applications, a power of 0.8 is necessary. In other cases, you might want more or less. Uh, and the same is true here. So um, there isn't really like this magic number of 75% of critical information gained is the answer for everything. Um, it just it provides context to how much testing we should do for a given application. Um, okay, so in summary, we developed this quantitative optimization algorithm um, that formalizes the current fusel test planning process. It's analogous to the type of DOE that we use in operational test and evaluation. Um, we think that this approach can help analysts select the optimal size of fusel test. Um, future work could also help analysts determine the specific locations of those fusel tests. Right now, they're pretty kind of coarse categories, but a more detailed version of this could also help specify specific conditions. Um, we illustrated this just using a notional armored vehicle on a very small scale just to show proof of concept. But there's a lot of future work that needs to be done. First, we would probably want to do what we would want to do, and we are actually currently working on it, a full-scale retrospective study on an actual program of record with all of the threats um, just to see how that works at scale. Uh, but we also, future work could also include sensitivity studies and algorithm improvements, um, among many other things prior to actual uh, implementation. So there's a lot of future work, um, but we do see a lot of potential as well. And with that, I will take any questions. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Terrell Hurst. I'm from Raytheon. I'm modeling a sim guy. I can't apologize if you covered this. I came in a little late. But since I'm a modeling sim guy, we need to validate simulation models. Does the simulation developer have a vote, or how does that play into your planning of which, which shots to take? So I would probably add that to what I would think our future work should be, right? I identify a lot. I think we should do a, a better job at planning actual tests and MS more kind of aligned together. Um, I think they should be planned together. Right now, the approach doesn't consider that, um, but I think absolutely you have to consider the tests that we need for MS validation um, when planning. Thank you. Yep. So uh, maybe a, a question or um, on for your sensitivity analyses that you're thinking of the, in the future. 
in kind of classic statistical methods for sequential sampling of designs, if you sample one point at a time versus three points at a time, you might end, so say you do one and then two and then mm -hmm. three, but then you, or, compo or as opposed to op op optimally sampling for the three all at once, you yep. end up with different points. Yes. So has, how does that work here? And have you thought through how you might kind of yes. play with the sensitivity on that? Yes, so um, great question. We have thought through that a little bit at least. So right now, the way that it works is it picks the best shot, and then it assumes that you've taken that, and then it goes through and picks the next best shot. Um, but the best two shots may not include the best one shot, right? It could be different. Um, so we want to improve the algorithm and optimize it so that it actually looks for the best set of two shots, the best set of three shots, and it doesn't currently work that way. Um, but we want it to prior to actual implementation. Um, as far as other sensitivity studies, things like that color map, right? Like, how sensitive is it to that? Because that could change um, all sorts of other, how sensitive is it to your actual inputs, similarity scores? I mean, there's tons of things. Um, but as far as, you know, grouping, we absolutely, it's on our list of things we want to improve.